Um, so welcome everyone uh, to the Nephrology Grand Rounds uh, today. Uh, I'm Swapnil Hiramad and I have the pleasure of uh, introducing uh, Girish Nadkarni from uh, Mount Sinai, New York. Uh, so Dr. Nadkarni is uh, an endowed uh, Fishburg Professor of Medicine at the uh, Mount Sinai Health Systems in New York. Uh, he's a fellow Mumbaiite, uh, having uh, done some training in mathematics, uh, interestingly enough, before uh, coming to Hopkins, did a master's there and did his internal medicine residency as well as fellowship at Mount Sinai. Um, at Mount Sinai, he's actually the um, uh, 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 chief of the division of uh, data driven and digital medicine, the D3M and co-director of the Mount Sinai Clinical Intelligence Center. Um, interestingly enough, um, you know, he um, uh, they, uh, this is sort of the topic to, for today on, on the mechanisms and predictions in epidemiology uh, for COVID-19 and the kidney as we uh, in Ontario, we enter the sixth wave. Uh, Girish also has uh, over 250 papers in, uh, you know, in high impact journals, including NEJM and JAMA, and he's got uh, several uh, grants from the NIH. So we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Nadkani today to speak to us about COVID-19 and the kidney. Go ahead, Girish. Thank you. Thank you, Swap. Um... Um, so I'm very honored and happy to be here with you all. Um, I wish it was in person, but not completely because I've heard Ottawa was a little cold at the time of this year. <laughs> and being a fellow Mumbaiker, Swap knows that we do not like the cold. Uh, but on a personal note, I would really th like to thank Dr. Hiram Atta. He's been sort of my Twitter big brother and uh, my mentor and my guide and my friend and uh, I talk to him I think every day on Twitter and uh, um, I'm inspired every day by his uh, commitment, his zeal and his um, total dedication to educating um, you know, kidney disease trainees and spreading the message of kidney health. So um, when Swap invited me, it was sort of a personal honor and I thank you for that Swap. I appreciate that. Um, uh, so uh, today I'm going to talk about the COVID-19 and the kidney. Um, so uh, I have disclosures uh, of uh, not really conflicts because I'm not going to talk about any of these in the talk, uh, but uh, uh, I, I want to take you back all, you know, most likely more than two years today. Uh, and we actually had the anniversary of the um, first case uh, detected in New York City uh, and probably the whole state um, uh, a few days back at Mount Sinai. This was uh, the first case detected in the state in New York at Mount Sinai, and this was a Mount Sinai patient, actually a Mount Sinai employee. And uh, when we saw this uh, in the New York Times, considering what had happened already in China and in Italy at that particular point of time, uh, we knew something was coming. Um, and I was on service at that time. Um, um, along with, you know, uh, I work at the VA, I used to work at the VA, and uh, along with nephrology, I also do general medicine service. I attend on general medicine service. So, uh, you know, I had a pretty bad feeling about this. And that bad feeling was extremely justified because this was what happened from uh, um, March of 2020 to uh, 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 July of 2020. So the blue lines are the actual number of cases. The pink lines are the PUI, which is the persons under investigation. So people who have presumed COVID-19, uh, but uh, also have, uh, you know, we're not uh, PCR or, well, we didn't have rapid antigen at that time, PCR positive detected yet. Um, so at one point of time, we had over 2000 patients in the system concurrently. Um, uh, and Mount Sinai Health System, for those of you know, who you know are unfamiliar with, is a health system of like nine hospitals in New York City area, treat over a million, million and a half patients per year. Um, you know, and it's a very geographically diverse sort of hospital um, system. Um, the main hospital is in, on the Upper East Side, um, which you would think is all rich white people, but it's actually not uh, uh, because it's at the intersection of the Upper East Side, East Harlem and West Harlem. The population breakdown is actually a third, a third, a third. So a third white, a third Hispanic and a third African-American. And then there are hospitals in 
Queens, in Brooklyn, um, in the, uh, Manhattan downtown. So I think it's one of, probably one of the most diverse health systems in the US at least. So, um, you know, we, we serve the rich white people of the Upper East Side, but we also serve diverse underserved communities. Um, and, they, you know, unfortunately, it was the diverse uh, underserved communities with the most hit. So at, at the end of uh, August, um, you know, uh, we had discharged over 8,000 patients with COVID. And over the time of, you know, the recent stats are staggering. We've tested over a million and a half people and we've treated in hospital at least uh, 50,000 people. So, you know, um, as usual, when something of this magnitude happens, the big data people come out of the woodwork and start saying big data at the time of big viruses. And, you know, all of this catchphrases start coming across how the world is using data and analytics to fight COVID-19. And this sounds great and this sounds cool, but the problem we have in the US is uh, our data is, you know, might be big, but it's not great. Um, you know, in, 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 we have in the, this problem is both at a macro level as well as at a micro level within health systems. So at a macro level, there are no good systems of reporting, unlike what you have in Canada, no good systems of reporting, no good systems of testing, no good systems of tracing. Um, I, inside the hospital, because we use uh, this EMR system that were not built with clinicians in mind, were built for billing purposes, uh, and you know basically. They started off with a bad foundation and kept adding stuff on top of it without even thinking about it. All of the data is essentially siloed. It's an inaccessible. It's incomplete, uh, and there's no way that the disk cross talks with each other. And you know, this is uh, a good uh, uh, representation of all of the electronic health record data that we have. Um, you know, we have structured data, which is basically anything you can put in a table and can assign a value to. We have semi-structured data, which is like lists of things, and we have unstructured data. And, you know, so it's it's awesome, you know, because you know you can say that we have big data and we have enormous data, whatever superlative of big you want to use. But the problem is that it's all siloed, it's not accessible, and it's not easily available for research. So, um, you know. This problem has been going on at Mount Sinai for the last 15 years, and you know, but you know, there used to be committees formed around it. Those committees used to meet after work hours at 5:30 to 6:30, talk about big things and do nothing. Uh, so basically, uh, I, I was part of those many committees, so I'm guilty as charged. But the good thing was that this uh, COVID-19 pandemic actually stirred people to action. Two things happened. One is a lot of non COVID-19 research just because it was in person was shut down um, and you know people wanted to help. Um, so what we decided to do was we decided to send across um, a call to all of the health system physicians, scientists, the, uh, you know, data scientists that if you want to help, you know, you can join us every day at four o'clock, you know, Kind of during work hours because work life balance is important. And we can see what we together we can do to help. And it was, you know, kind of the worst of times in my life because uh, my wife was pregnant. Uh, um, you know, I did not, you know, we did not know what COVID 19 would do to the baby. Uh, and, uh, but I had a purpose. And I think a lot of us joined together because we had a common purpose in order to use uh, at least some knowledge. Uh, to help uh, combat this virus. And we came together organically as uh, what was called a Mount Sinai COVID Informatics Center, uh, which was uh, 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 formed very, very organically. No funding, no help from the school, just a bunch of people who knew something about data and who knew something about analytics just coming together and deciding that you know we need to do something about this and um, this is Alex uh, he's the director of the Mount Sinai COVID Informatics Center uh, I, the COVID Informatics Center has now evolved into the clinical intelligence center where this approach sort of a decentralized crowdfunded approach is going to be used for uh, uh, beyond COVID as we move from, I, mean, I don't think we can move completely from code, but sort of other use cases as well. And this has sort of four 
branches, right? So we needed infrastructure because the current health system infrastructure was not meant for analytics. We need a centralized engineering core and people rotate in and out of this engineering core. Um, we needed what called as a critical informatics consultation service where, you know, at the time because this disease was completely unknown, we didn't know anything about it. So we needed answers fast, right? You know, like what's happening to patients? What's the mortality rate? Are there any uh, risk factors for mortality? And we've learned an enormous amount of this disease, but, you know, can you in March 2020, April 2020, we knew almost nothing about this. And finally, in order to put it into clinical practice, in order to put this information in front of uh, uh, clinicians, we wanted to do what's called a rapid clinical intervention kit. So I'm not going to go over this. So this brings us to the topic of the talk, right? Um, so uh, uh, initially, COVID-19 was thought to be just a respiratory virus, you know, it affects the lungs, you know, the cause damage to the lungs that causes problems with like uh, ventilation and lung in the ICU. But it very big clearly became very it very clearly became evident that kidneys are a big part of the uh, um, um, a big part of the manifestations of COVID-19. So I'm going to structure this talk into four aspects and give you examples in uh, each of these aspects. First, I would like to talk about the epidemiology of AKI, acute kidney injury in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. Second, I'm going to talk about SARS-CoV-2 viral load at a time of um, admission and kidney injury. I'm going to talk about proteomics in patients with COVID-19, sort of shedding some light on the mechanisms. And finally, I'm going to talk about prediction of dialysis requirement and giving that information back to uh, people who allocate resources. So the occurrence of acute kidney injury among hospitalized COVID-19 patients are very variable, right? Uh, so data coming out from China was extremely, extremely unreliable. And SWAP and others had done an amazing job of putting together a living document uh, of, you know, sort of a living systematic review of kidney injury in COVID. Um, so part of this numbers are from there and you know I should have uh, 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 you know all thanks to Swapnil. Um, so in Italy the numbers are around 30 percent. Seattle which was one of the early outbreaks was 19 percent. We didn't really know what, what, what it was in the New York metropolitan area. So I'm going to talk about Mount Sinai health system data and other large centers data studies. So in the Mount Sinai, we actually, this was one of our first papers, we wanted to provide information about frequency, outcomes, and recovery associated with AKI and dialysis in hospitalized COVID-19 patients in New York City. It was an observational retrospective study. Uh, the patients were admitted to the hospital between February 27th and April 15th, again, in the early stages of the pandemic. And we sort of froze the data on April 22nd, so people had seven days of follow-up. Um, the exposures were KDCO criteria, peak serum creatinine um, uh, of uh, uh, 0.3, increase of 0.3 or 50% above baseline. And all of this work was done by Lily Chan, um, uh, who's uh, an assistant now associate professor of medicine at Mount Sinai. So we had 3,000 or almost 4,000 patients admitted in a month and a half. Uh, uh, month and a half. A bunch of patients were excluded because of various reasons. Uh, we had around 3,200 patients for analysis. You know, divided them up into discharge, non-discharge patients, and discharge patients. And in the discharge patients, the AKI rates were approximately 40%. Non-discharge patients, AKI, or those who were still in the hospital because they were sicker, the AKI rate was 66%. And this look at the base, uh, the baseline characteristics. Ignore the table because you know I like putting up big tables out there and it's just giving the points. Patients who had AKI, and we know this from time immemorial, right? Were older, have more comorbidities, had more CHF, had more diabetes, had more hypertension. They had higher WBC and lower albumin. Surprisingly, they had slightly higher blood pressure, which I think was because of resuscitation. Um, they had. Uh, a slightly higher heart rate and lower oxygen saturations. So in every patient, all of the patients, um, most of the AKI was stage one. Um, some of the AKI was stage two. 
three, uh, uh, smaller proportion of the AKI was stage three, and around 20% of the patients required dialysis. In the ICU, it was closer to 30 to 35% of patients requiring dialysis, and outside the ICU, it was around 10% of patients requiring dialysis. Most of the risk factors associated with AKI were, you know, kind of known, right? Chronic kidney disease, you know, higher WBC count, lower albumin. Um, uh, race didn't actually come up here. It came up in other papers because I think we had a pretty even split. So maybe it was that reason, but race didn't come up here. And in terms of outcomes, obviously, if you had acute kidney injury, you had uh, a higher risk of uh, any all bad outcomes happening, right? I mean, again, not unexpected. Uh, you had a higher risk of ICU admission. You had a higher risk of mechanical ventilation, vasopressor use, lower risk of discharge, higher risk of in-hospital mortality. In patients who had just, you know, who were discharged or had 14 days of follow-up, same trend. So AKI in COVID-19 is bad. Um, and if you look at the adjusted odds ratio, um, uh, the adjusted odds ratio was, you know, 10 times as, you know, you're 10 times more likely to die uh, as opposed to if you had AKI as a versus if you didn't have AKI. And if you were in the IC, you are 20 times more likely to die if you had AKI as opposed to non-AKI. So AKI was like a biggest factor for mortality. Actually, uh, you know, I, this was evident, but at the time, you know, People were still not considering COVID-19 and AKI as an issue, and this was one of the first papers to show that COVID-19 and AKI is an issue. And the survival probability 30 days after in, after admission was much much lower in patients who had acute kidney injury as opposed to who didn't have acute kidney injury. Now this was borne out in multiple studies. Um, uh, this is paper from Kenar's group at uh, Northwell, again a large health system at uh, in New York City. Um, at more hospitals in Mount Sinai, um, and you know they also showed similar numbers, right? Um, uh, around 40% of people, very similar to us, had a acute kidney injury. AKI mostly peaked around day three to day four, and similar risk factors and. It occurs frequently, occurs early, and and had a poor prognosis. And this is the stop COVID study, which is led by David Leaf and Shruti Gupta from uh, um, Harvard. And we contributed data to the study. We were the largest contributor, actually. Um, and you know, among all critically ill patients, 21% um, uh, again very similar numbers to us. Not surprising because we were like, the largest contributor. Um, develop AKI and high mortality and 34% of patients who survived remained dialysis dependent on discharge. And again, very, very similar risk factors. So we can now maybe agree on AKI incidence in the first serve, right? Uh, we think it's around 30, 20 to 30% and critically ill, maybe it's around 60 to 70%. And timing of AKI is reasonably clear, right? This is again paper from Kenar's group uh, in Kidney International, the seminal paper on AKI, which shows that AKI peaks usually around day one to three, and then there's a late peak. This might be iatrogenic or you know hospital related, or in th there's obviously a bias here, you have to survive to seven days. Because remember in those days, early mortality was very, very high with these patients, right? So what's less clear is how acute kidney injury will change over the course of the pandemic and what are the longer term kidney outcomes of AKI and there's some light being shared on this. So um, th this uh, was uh, done by Sergio and that's his cat, I guess, um, for uh, who's one of my fellows. We looked at acute kidney injury until December of 2021. Uh, going from March of uh, 2020, uh, sorry, December of 2020, um, not March. Uh, so as you can see, the, the solid line is the number of patients in the hospital at any given point of time. Uh, in March, April, and May, um, you know, 40% of patients, give or take, had acute kidney injury. This, as the numbers decreased, the number of patients with AKI, the proportion of patients with AKI also decreased to around 20%. And um, the uh, 
clear uh, bar is the number of patients with dialysis and that remained kind of stable-ish at around 10 to 15 percent throughout the numbers. So I think this tells me one big thing, right? If there are more patients in the hospital and the hospital is exposed to surge conditions uh, and, you know, uh, there is, uh, you know, bad and we don't know much, you know, we had like issues with fluid management. We were like drying out the people because of were worry about ventilation, etc. At that time, the, during the actual surge, the AKI numbers were sky high. But as the number of patients came down, the AKI numbers came low. So a lot of this might not be due to the intrinsic virus or because of the sickness of the patients. It might be because of just management issues, right? Um, and, you know, we have data on this. This was published in kidney medicine, but we have data on this until this year. The numbers of acute, acute kidney injury are still around 20%, but the number of dialysis requirements have decreased dramatically. So the first, uh, the second thing is, you know, how will these patients do, right, long term? That's always a big thing on our minds. Um, so most of the patients actually recovered. But there were still some patients who had acute kidney disease stage three. Oh, sorry, uh, acute kidney disease 14 days after hospitalization. Again, this is very early numbers, uh, but uh, uh, around uh, 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 so we had 832 patients who survived at who survived until discharge. 65% recover. On the patients who had we had around three months of follow-up data around 68% had completely recovered to the baseline, but around 32% have not. And if you follow this up, I think longitudinally, I think some people will have still residual kidney damage, but I think a, a lot of people will recover. Then um, I apologize, I should have put Ziad's new study in, which showed that uh, you know ESRD and CKD were manifestations of COVID-19 even a year out in veterans. So again, it's a veterans population, 96% male, um, slightly older, so I don't know how representative it is of the general population. But we are conducting this long-term study called as long-term uh, outcomes of chronic kidney disease in COVID or long COVID, uh, where aim one is to look at COVID-19 AKI versus non-COVID-19 AKI. So just as a bit of a background, we have this uh, COVID-19 follow-up cohort at Mount Sinai where people are undergoing protocolized follow-up at every six months of uh, after acute COVID-19, either hospitalized versus not. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a, uh, it helps us get into what the national COVID-19 or post-acute sequelae of COVID-19 study called PASC, uh, which is called RECOVER. So, so I think the answers are coming. Like, how much of an issue is this going to be? Like, a year down the line, two years down the line, three years down the line. I think it will be an issue, but I think it won't be as much we worried about. But that's my sense. But again, I have no data to prove this. So again, in summary, AKI was common among, uh, you know, uh, uh, among. By dialysis, high uh, around a third were discharged with still renal dysfunction. Though I think this number is quite overstated. It might be lower. You know, AI and kin therapy incidents have changed over the course of the pandemic, and long-term studies are needed. That's what they always say to get grant funding at the end. Uh, so the second thing I want to talk about is sars 2 cov viral load and kidney injury. So this is a good paper from GRN, which basically sort of showed different pathways of how SARS-CoV-2 could affect the kidneys. And the, earlier, there was this huge issue that SARS-CoV-2 could actually get into the kidney because, you know, ACE2 and uh, uh, the transmembrane protein, protease serine 2 is present in the kidney and it can infect the kidney and people are thinking about high van similar to covan. And you know, SARS-CoV-2 had been quantified in renal compartments. You know, this was an NGM paper which showed that you know, in 22 patients, you know, like most of them, SARS-CoV-2 was present in the kidneys. And this was a Lancet paper which showed that in 63 kidney biopsy samples, patients who had SARS-CoV-2 in the kidney uh, actually did much worse in terms of like kidney outcomes, etc. 
but then uh, came this many papers showing that um, and this is again from a um, uh, uh, couple of this papers are from Kenar's group uh, then from Astrid Wentz, which basically showed that uh, uh, you know there's no real uh, infection quote unquote direct viral invasion of the kidney right uh, and it was completely negative of detection of SARS-CoV-2 using immunohistochemistry and in situ hybridization. So this has like two schools of thought, and I don't think we have resolved this. Some people say that the SARS-CoV-2 in the kidney. Some people say that there is no SARS-CoV-2 in the kidney. I'm not trying to resolve this debate, but I'm, I'm going to present some sort of supportive data, which are uh, in both directions. So the question we had was, is there an association with SARS-CoV-2 viral load at admission with acute kidney injury? And we know that SARS-CoV-2 viral load predicts COVID-19 mortality. This is a paper that we had in Lancet, which showed that after adjusting for a bunch of this risk factors, not causal risk factors, SARS-CoV-2 viral load was still an independent association of mortality in COVID-19. And if you had sort of high SARS-CoV-2 viral load, high being defined as above the median, you were sort of much more, uh, sorry, not more, much more, but a higher likelihood of mortality than if you didn't have SARS-CoV-2 in the kidney. And all of this work was done by the chief of, or the chair of pathology at Mount Sinai, Carlos and Elizabeth, uh, who was her student. So we had, uh, we decided to look at the same in uh, AKI. The problem with AKI is that it's, AKI is a compete death is a competing risk for AKI and AKI is a uh, risk for death. so the the, the uh, state just become become a little complicated but anyways I'll present what I have and you know I'll I'll give you my interpretation of it it might be wrong uh, so we had around 1100 patients with COVID-19 and viral load we started to fight them by AKI status uh, you know people who were had uh, AKI where again, you know, you know all of this. People who had, th this is the, I guess this is the important thing. People who had COVID-19 and AKI had slightly higher viral loads than people who did not have AKI. And all of this work was done by Ishan Paranjpe, who's um, who was a medical student now is going to Stanford on the medical scientist track. So if you look quantified, if you did joint modeling of discharge, death, and AKI, so I mean, you know, you have a person in the hospital, three outcomes can happen. You can die, you, can, you know, you can die, get AKI and die, you can get AKI and not die, or you can get discharged. If uh, uh, in patients who were in the top 50th percentile of the viral, of viral load, uh, you know, AKI was much high, was higher than people who within the bottom 50th percentile of viral load. Um, death was also higher slightly and discharge probabilities were lower. And each log 10 increment was associated with the 4% hazard increment for AKI. Um, and individuals in like the top 50% had a 30% increase hazard ratio even after adjusting for all of the risk factors that I already mentioned. So there's, so, after adjustment for confounders, there was a significant but very, very weak association of SARS-CoV-2 viral load. I do not think that this is supportive evidence that SARS-CoV-2 infects the kidney because of more data that I'll show with proteomics later on. And I think it just represents just severity of illness with a greater viral inoculum because if you get a greater viral inoculum at the start, you're sick, you get sicker, you get sicker, you get more AKI. All right, so I'm going to talk about proteomics in patients with COVID-19 AKI in the last 15 to 20 minutes, and then prediction of acute dialysis requirements. This is sort of another different figure which shows various pathways. And again, a lot of pathways have been postulated, right? Direct viral invasion still, even in reviews from this year became in 2022, still has, is said to have a role. But uh, what we did during the pandemic was we basically biobanked blood, not urine, unfortunately, because of the hard to collect samples on a number of people. Um, um, we, uh, 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 I think we we uh, used routine clinical care when they were getting the routine blood draw in the morning as uh, 
sort of the entry into biobanking these people. And we did a bunch of assays on them, including Olink, which is a proteomics assay, and Somalogic, which is another proteomics assay. And we managed to biobank close to a thousand, uh, 700 people during this initial wave. So uh, this work was done by Pushkala Jairaman, who's a PhD student in my lab. So we had uh, uh, patients uh, uh, who were admitted between March 24th, which is when the biobanking started in August 26th. We excluded patients with a history of end stage kidney disease. We excluded patients who had AKI after like the last SOMA scan time point. Um, so and that left us with around 450 patients. Out of them, 71 patients had AKI stage two and three, and 366 patients had AKI stage one and no AKI. And we selected the last SOMA scan time point during the hospital administration. So again, this was what changes are happening in the blood proteome during prevalent AKI. This was not about prediction of AKI, but more about prevalent AKI. And this was the Mount Sinai sort of uh, uh, discovery cohort. Um, again, because the biobanking was tied to regular clinical care, there was very little where you could control the exact timing of the sample of the specimen. So it was it, it's, it's a messy cohort, but it's a large cohort with proteomics at scale, so we can glean some insights from it. So out of uh, the 440 odd patients, 71 had stage 2 or stage 3 AKI and 366 did not have acute kidney injury. Um, you know, higher number of diabetes, obviously higher chronic kidney disease. People who had AKI required, you know, more care. So in, indicated by sort of higher respiratory support, more were intubated, um, more were, high, you know, less were on a nasal cannula. And, you know, because with proteomics or any sort of omics work, there's a chance of having a lot of false positives. We went around looking for a, a replication cohort, and this cohort in Canada and McGill, the Quebec 19 Biobank, uh, was very, you know, you know, agreed to collaborate thanks to them. And we had a smaller, sorry, we had a smaller cohort uh, from them, around 250 patients with 35 patients having, having stage two or three AKI. Um, so it was like around half this half the size of our cohort, but it was still a validation cohort. So we, we used these two cohorts. We measured SOMA scan. The SOMA scan platform for, uh, um, and I apologize, so I should have a slide on that, uh, um, has over 2,000 patients that are quantified and uh, 1,000 that are not named. Um, um, you know, uh, opinions vary whether it's one of the best proteomics platforms, but it's one of the most widely used, and it's what we had because uh, they gave us a good deal. Um, so uh, if you look at the principal component analysis of uh, a protein expression in the discovery cohort, this is what are called PCA plots. So you take the AKI cases versus controls and you see if any of the proteomics sort of draws a clear bright line distinguishing between AKI cases versus controls. So you deconvolute the data into its principal components you separate them out or you try to separate them out and see if you can find a line of demarcation and you can keep doing this recursively until you find appropriate line of demarcation so in piece you can see that there's pretty good separation between the yellow dots which are stage one or no aki and the blue dots which are stage two and three aki um so the point of the slide in is that you know, proteomics, there are changes in proteomics happening between prevalent AKI versus non prevalent AKI. And then we looked at, you know, proteins that were significant in the discovery cohort and see, saw if they were significant in the validation cohort. And, you know, a number of proteins were significant in both discovery as well as validation. So these proteins were independently validated in another validation cohort. So 443 proteins were associated with stage A2 or 3 AKI in the discovery cohort. Out of the 443, 62 proteins were associated with AKI in the validation cohort. And you know we'll talk about the post-discharge GFR trend in a bit. However, if you take all of this protein and put them into like a network, right? Actually, what is happening? Two networks pop up. The first, you know, so these are what is called as nodes. So nodes are where the functions of proteins sort of interact. So if you have like two or three proteins, 
which indicate tubular dysfunction like ngal or kim1 right they will intersect at a tubular dysfunction node if you have two or three proteins that have like uh, cardiac dysfunction they will intersect at the cardiac dysfunction node so among the kidney disease three nodes were like very very important lcn2 which is basically ngal uh, REG3A, which is again acute kidney injury and tubular dysfunction, and FAB3, which is tubular and cardiac dysfunction. In the cardiac nodes, like these are all cardiac proteins like titan, myosin, heavy chain, FAB3, um, all of these nodes interact at one node, which indicates dysfunction in cardiac structure or myocardial damage. If so, my point I'm trying to make here is that if viral invasion and direct viral injury was a big component of this. The nodes would have looked very different interacting at ACE2 or TRMP st 2 or maybe viral injury. But in this case, the only important sort of pathophysiological nodes that we could find were tubular dysfunction and cardiac injury. And uh, this was very similar if you looked at post discharge kidney dysfunction. All of the proteins, the tubular proteins that were associated with pre prevalent AKI, a lot of them were also associated with like uh, uh, post discharge kidney disease. Um, so we had data around like two years after the measurement, and all of these proteins, like cystatin C, is like a good positive control to have, right? Uh, but trifoil factor three, again, tubular dysfunction. This one, tubular dysfunction, desmocolin 2, tubular dysfunction. All of the proteins that were associated with long term EGFR decline were all proteins associated with tubular dysfunction. No protocyte proteins, no viral proteins, all proteins associated with tubular dysfunction. So, if there was something to come away from this particular thing, I think that the major risk, the major factors that are happening here are tubular damage and cardiac damage and cardiac damage potentially leading to uh, a significant the cardio renal cardio kidney crosstalk and tubular damage at least on the proteomics i could not we could not find any evidence of the hypercoagulability we could not find any evidence of direct viral invasion and while i do think that porocytopathy and uh, uh, sort of the covan thing is an important mechanism i think it's rare it only happens in people who have pre-existing risk factors like APOL1 or something of that sort. Uh, so, you know, these were, uh, so I think the garden variety, for lack of a better word, tubular necrosis is the major mechanism of COVID-19 associated AKI. And, you know, uh, I think it's going to become more and more clear as more and make big, bigger studies come online. So, in summary, we identified specific protein markers of COVID-19 associated AKI and long-term kidney dysfunction. We found two major mechanisms, tubular injury and cardiac slash hemodynamic perturbation. And we found an interesting biomarker that we will plan to follow up, the trifoil factor 3, TFF3. Uh, but again, it's a tubular dysfunction biomarker. It's not really anything you know, unique. All right, so the fourth thing I'm going to talk about is prediction of acute dialysis requirement. Um, so, um, in the early phases of the pandemic, um, everyone was focused on ventilators. We even got CPAP machines sent by Elon Musk. God knows what we did with those <laughs> at one point of time to Mount Sinai. Uh, uh, but dialysis was a pretty sort of uh, 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 unmet need because dialysis machines can't, the set number of them can't be repurposed. Supplies are very limited. And this man who I hate, Mehmet Oz, uh, uh, the reason I'm putting him here is, uh, you know, he did one good thing in his life, which is basically send around a call for all dialysis nurses uh, uh, to help. I don't know if anyone helped because of him, but at least he sent out on the call. But anyway, I hate him, like really hate him. So, uh, you know, in the last part of my talk, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence and AI is a big buzzword right now. Uh, it basically, you know, but it, you know, it talks about like AI in my sense is basically just like advanced analytics to deconvolute messy data. 
And, you know, this is a slide from Mark Okuza in Kidney Week 2018, which says that, you know, nephrology being a numbers game that we are should be the leader in, you know, data analytics and machine learning. And I kind of agree with him. So the question is, could we accurately predict requirement for dialysis using machine learning? This work was done by Kumar Deep Chaudhary, who was a postdoc in my lab and now is leading his own group in India, and Akhil, who's still a postdoc. Um, so we took, uh, 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 again, Mount Sinai is eight hospitals. We had data from like six, or five hospitals at the time. So we took the main hospital which for training and internal validation and the remaining four hospitals for external validation. Um, you know, we took data from patients who had confirmed COVID-19 patients, where inpatient had aged greater than 18 years, positive COVID-19 RT-PCR. Um, we excluded patients who had existing end stage kidney disease, had death prior to a session of dialysis, so a little bit of bias there, but the point was to show that, you know, prevent, to predict dialysis, not death. Uh, excluded patient features with like more than 30%. And the point was to try to, uh, predict dialysis at different time points during the hospital stay of the patient, like one day, three days, five days, and seven days. Um, and if you look at the performance characteristics uh, of the models over the various time periods, we use compared against logistic regression because I think you know a lot of people don't compare against logistic regression when sometimes simple tools can work as better as complex tools. Um, and the, the uh, model called the XGBoost, which is a tree-based model that basically makes decision trees like uh, across various variables, performed the best with the AUC of 0.96 in internal validation. So sometimes when the outcome is rare, um, you know, AUC can be falsely exaggerating because it's easier to guess no than yes most of the times. So we use also AUPRC, which is area under the precision recall curve, which basically weights precision and recall more than just sensitivity and specificity. And AUPRC was also pretty good from a baseline AUPRC of 0.24 for logistic regression. This sort of held up in external validation. Um, the non-imputed, uh, sorry, this should have been moved down. The non-imputed one also performed well during um, uh, uh, in the horizon of three days, performed well on external validation. I think the non-imputed XGBoost model was a better model because we didn't have to impute or guess at any variables. We just took the variables as is. Worked better at uh, uh, five days and worked better at uh, um, uh, seven days. So basically now we had a model that worked reasonably well with an AUC of around 0.9 and an AUPRC of 0.5. It could guess with a fair amount of accuracy which patients would require dialysis within the next five days, seven days. So what do we do with this? Do we publish it or do we try to help someone with it? Um, oh, and this last slide basically are, is what's called a sharp plots, which shows, uh, tries to explain, quote unquote, this black box of models. Um, so the sharp plots is a graphical way of explaining what features are important in a model. Um, so on the right, if you have a value, it basically um, pushes the model to make a positive prediction and the color of the value sort of shows whether a high or a low value is making the positive prediction. So if you look at serum creatinine, baseline serum creatinine, a high value of serum creatinine is pushing the model towards making a positive prediction. A low value of pH is sort of pushing the model towards making, uh, sorry, a high value of pH is pushing the model to make, sort of make a lower prediction or a low value of pH is making the model like a higher prediction. So, I mean, if you look through, and this is a this is a busy figure, but if you look through, there's nothing really surprising about this, right? Like it's the same things that we see, which clinically intuit, right? Creatinine, pH, C-reactive protein, maybe uh, uh, glucose, BMI, blood pressure. So, you know, we obviously we should publish this, you know, because you know, but at the same time, we want to like give this information to clinicians or more importantly, nurses and nurse managers because they want to know in the hospital with like X number of patients how many have a high probability of requiring dialysis over a certain period of time, right? Uh, uh, because they can order supplies, call in nurses if needed, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So we wanted to combine all of this medical record information, risk factors into a centralized tool. It, we wanted it to be accessed by existing system because clinicians are busy. I just came off service last night and we don't want to click off multiple buttons. 
we wanted a concise summary of relevant information and all of this work was done with Robbie Freeman who's the VP who's, who's actually a nurse informaticist and is the VP of data driven initiatives at Mount Sinai. So this is our old slide, but we actually deployed this thing within Epic. It's been deployed since and it's been recalibrated every time the waves have hit because the numbers have gone up and down. So we could tell the patients that, you know, uh, the physicians or the nurses who are seeing them what the dial, the discharge proportion is, the intubation risk level is, and the dialysis risk level is, what, what uh, sort of uh, 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 oxygen are they on what medication they're using this is an old slide i apologize but now it's changed because you know we don't really use undecibel or uh, we don't use convalescent plasma and if you click on each one of the predictions you can actually tell it tells you why it's making this prediction uh, and what are the risk factors involved in the prediction so going towards a little bit of explainability so in summary, um, you know, dialysis requirement had strained resources. It strained resources in the first wave, strained resources in the delta wave, strained resources in the Omicron wave. Um, um, so we developed and validated a machine learning model for accurate dialysis predictions over various time horizons and known clinical factors were found to be primary drivers of this model performance. And we put it in to use for nurse managers and to, for resource allocation for clinicians to maybe plan discharge or requirement for dialysis. So that's the end of my talk. And um, at this point of time, I would like thank my mother, mother my father, <laughs> you know, because I believe in the Oscars, not the slaps, but the actual Oscars. Uh, but I would like to thank, you know, physicians. And I know some some of you don't like Fauci, and that's fine. Uh, but <laughs> this is one of my favorite figures, uh, my favorite uh, 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 pictures from JAMA, I think last year where it showed all of the, it was called faces of the first responders. And, uh, um, you know, I think we've all gone through a lot for the last two years and you're still going through it right now. So thank you more importantly for doing all what you do. And, uh, you know, uh, if no, you know, sometimes we feel unappreciated and um, by the big bosses uh, and I feel unappreciated uh, as well, but, you know, uh, we still do what we have to do to save a patient. So thank you for that. Uh, 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 fine. Uh, this is my family. Uh, my wife was pregnant during the COVID-19. Uh, this and my baby is a, one of the one of the coronials. The whole group of children that were born during the pandemic. And this is at the Natural History Museum last week. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the honor. And you know, I'm happy to take questions. I think I've ended right in time. Fantastic. That was a great overview, Girish. And and you covered a lot of different uh, you know areas. The epidemiology machine learning as well as proteomics it's it's amazing the kind of work you guys have uh, have managed to do during the pandemic and were able to pivot uh, your point about the uh, epidemiology changing is is uh, is very uh, was very cool right i mean we have always wondered if it was the are the variants somehow different in causing AKI? Uh, because we saw the same thing that the AKI numbers have dropped, uh, but maybe it was the surge uh, uh, and all that. Um, what do you think about you know the cause of that apart from this, or could it be that we are got better at treating uh, you know the systemic inflammation that's associated with DEXA and all that? So I, I did show some data and it's unpublished data, but basically, you know the variants are predictors, but the variants also happen during different surges, right? So I think we've just gotten better at treating it. You know, um, uh, there's a huge association of surge conditions with uh, worse outcomes and worse AKI during this period. So I just think we've gotten better at treating, and then systemic treatments have gotten better. And you know, in hospital or not over, and patients get better care. So we should prevent try to prevent hospitals from being overwhelmed. <laughs> so I, I I don't think that there's anything. Again, you know, you would expect variants to only theoretically you would expect variants to affect only if there was a direct effect on the kidney. But if there is, it's just a manifestation. It's just garden variety AKI. Basically, how sick people people are, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so if anyone ha uh, else has any questions, please raise your hand and unmute yourself and free to ask. Or you can also type in the chat box. Um, and while people are thinking about uh, the questions, uh, the other question I had was about Epic, right? We also have Epic uh, and uh, as our EMR, and, and you were able to develop this machine learning tool and incorporate into Epic. Do you have any um, tri tips or tricks or, or insight into how easy or how difficult was that? Did you have to work with the 
with Epic or or is it so something that you have a relationship? So we had to work with. So Epic has. Uh, so Epic is terrible, first of all. Uh, <laughs> uh, but Epic has what's called a middleware layer at every health system where every health system can do a fair bit of customization without any requirement from um, any requirement to go to like the main source. Um, so you probably guys have probably an Epic team that can do this. Uh, you know, it just requires sort of clinical will and it requires not political, political is in the right word, administrative will. Um, so, you know, it, this got done in like seven days. The, you know, I can give you the technical details on how it happened. It was basically an X window that opened onto Epic uh, and got incorporated into this. But if uh, there's sort of administrative will and IT will, then this can happen on uh, this. But I can, I'm happy to like walk you through it offline. It just requires a lot of, it's a separate presentation by itself. Uh, and and uh, so you did this in the this was mostly COVID AKI, right? The prediction. Yeah. Um, do you uh, are you planning to expand it to the um, uh, non COVID AKI setting? I mean, uh, perhaps the need is less and it's harder to develop that, of course, uh, if there is no surge. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little worried of doing that um, for a few reasons. One is that. Um, you know, alerts like plague our lives on a regular basis. I don't want to add an, another alert which is useless. Second thing, work has from Perry and other people have shown that alerting people about AKI may not confer any benefit and may be harmful, right? The third thing is that, uh, uh, you know, uh, um, this was particularly developed during search conditions when there was a strain on dialysis resources and was meant more for resource allocation. There usually is not a, that much of a strain on dialysis resources in in times of peace, right? For like you know better word. So if there's no need for it and no one's crying out for it, what's the point of developing it? Absolutely right. And then you made a very good point that this uh, it's not to change clinical practice, but it's to predict uh, need for resources down the line, and that's a completely legitimate use rather than. Uh, pretending to think that you know you're going to change and, and prevent AKI or, or something like that. AI will change um, the world types. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, uh, while, while uh, you know, again, people feel free to uh, raise your hand or unmute yourself. Um, with this proteomic stuff, uh, you know, where do you go from here? Uh, is it like you're happy that you showed that it's mostly garden variety? You know, it's mostly acute tubular injury, or or do you think there is anything else uh, with those markers yeah. that can be used for mechanistic uh, or pathophysiology? So I think we pointed to the direction of mechanistic pathophysiology, but for mechanistic pathophysiology, we are going to need like tissue, to be honest, right? So um, I think the program that we've started with lock COVID, because one of the aims in lock COVID is mechanistic pathophysiology, banking biopsies from people who have been referred for a clinical biopsy or uh, so you have a pro we have a program in Mount Sinai where you can bank an extra core of tissue uh, from uh, people who have been referred for a clinical biopsy. Uh, um, I think that is going to happen. The second thing I think is going to happen is a lot of the focus is shifting from acute COVID because you know now Acute COVID has a very different phenotype from what happened in 2020 and maybe parts of 2021. It's, you know, to be honest, mostly unvaccinated, um, you know, individuals on, you know, uh, similar um, to sort of long term COVID. So NIH has started this large study called as a recover initiative, which basically is trying to elucidate pathophysiological mechanisms of uh, post COVID, the post COVID syndrome. So I think um, they, they have you know, I, I fought strongly to, um, I'm one of the PIs of the study, so I fought strongly to keep COVID-19 uh, associated kidney injury as one. And there will be a certain number of people that will have biopsies banked during routine clinical biopsies or may have protocol biopsies depending upon bleeding risk. Um, so I think that you would help elucidate a point of it. But this, you know, this sort of strongly or not strongly, reasonably proves our hypothesis that I do think that COVID-19, the vast majority of it is garden variety, uh, you know, because of reflections of sickness, right? Um, you know, and, you know, all of those fears of COVID-19 infecting the kidney are in 
largely they, it might happen in a very small subset. I can't prove disprove that, but I can I can definitely say that it's not happening in the vast majority of cases. Absolutely, yeah, and, and I totally agree with that. Um, Mark, you had a question. Yeah, uh, thanks very much. Curious, like I, I've been following the literature a bit, and Swapnil has been our sort of uh, go-to person for asking questions about what what should we be doing. But uh, I guess that you know a lot of the data uh, initially, at least, would have come, and you you alluded to this a bit, like in the in essentially an unvaccinated population. So you're really looking at natural history of a new virus, and now like everything is so dynamic, right? So you've got you've got an increasingly vaccinated population, although maybe waning a little bit. And then you've got, you know, a, a, a virus that's not totally new anymore. And so, you know, when you're looking at things like the proteomics data, or, or let's say multiomics, because I'm sure there's other groups looking at different things. What, what do we know about people in terms of that, who, where it's not the original virus anymore, uh, the virus knows more about us and we know more about the virus. Like, do we know anything about the proteomics sort of from the very early stage versus now? And my second question is, um, we're seeing people with reinfection. Uh, so, you know, they had the original strain and now they've Omicron or Delta, now Omicron or now BA2. Um, are those people getting kidney injury the second time around? Or, you know, is is it a you know, does it does it help you to have, let's say, uh, an infection on top of a vaccine in terms of your uh, risk of kidney injury? What's the relationship between your acquired or, you know, um, via vaccine or infection, your acquired immunity and uh, kidney risk? So to answer your first question first, uh, as you correctly pointed out, this proteomic study was done in, you know, unva because the vaccine wasn't available at that time. But I, you know, I would argue that if uh, if this shows sort of that it's mostly garden variety AKI, I would find it a stretch to believe that in vaccinated people where the severity of disease is less and the viral replication is less, because that's been shown that right? if you get vaccinated and the you know even though it doesn't completely block transmission, the viral replication is reduced. It would be viral invasion or some other mechanism. Um, however, proteomic studies are ongoing. Obviously, you know, uh, uh, proteomics studies are expensive, uh, so it's it's hard to find funding to actually do them uh, and do them well. But they are ongoing in like the new waves. We have a study called as Mask COVID, uh, which Evelyn uh, Aziglou is running. So, you know, keep uh, uh, keep tuned. Though I would be very surprised if you find anything substantially different in the uh, uh, in the uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of like basically showing that this is just a reflection of overall sickness. As to your second question, I think the rates of AKI have substantially gone down, uh, at least in the community and, you know, I'm part of national studies where the rates of AKI basically have halved um, and are much closer now to quote unquote general rates of AKI or to be common, uh, to be a little more. Uh, comparing apples to apples rate of substance associated AKI. Um, so uh, um, uh, uh, with Omicron, because uh, Omicron, the hospitalized people show have just been the tip of the iceberg, right? Because so many people got infected in the community. Um, but in the hospitalized people would not see, we saw downturn in acute kidney injury, actually. People were much less sicker as well. Uh, um, I do think that there is an immune component to AKI, uh, but that immune component particularly is around how sick you get. Right? How So I don't think that the immune component directly affects the kidney. Now, obviously, there are a certain number of you know, uh, situations, for example, COVID associated COVID, COVID nephropathy or COVID associated nephropathy, which happens in individuals who have pre existing risk, like two APOL1 risk variants, which causes collapsing glomerulopathy similar to high van. And I'm not discounting those. I just think that they're a very, very small proportion of the overall kidney disease that we see. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. 
Um, so it is uh, nine and, and I know Girish is uh, post call. Uh, so we'd like to uh, stay on time and, and finish on time. Thank you again. Uh, that was a wonderful overview. Uh, and, and again, uh, congratulations on uh, all the research that you guys were able to pivot and do in, in such a short period of time in the middle of the, you know, the, the most uh, important uh, event of our lives. Uh, thanks again. Hope to see you in person one day in, in Ottawa. Maybe Thank we'll invite you in the summer when it's warmer. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again for this. Bye. Bye-bye.